talk about this concept of sense of place, which um, really is, is something that has been puzzling me ever since the debate about fracking started. And so in a way, I'm maybe not really going to talk about fracking per se, but I think we've, we've had, heard a lot about it and we've been talking about all of the environmental impacts for a long time now. Um, but I was curious from the start when there were plans to, um, you know, plans were announced to at least start in the prospecting phase, um, because there seemed to be something a little bit more here. Because yes, we are talking about um, impacts, for example, on water in an area that is water stressed. We are talking about um, other related impacts, air quality, we're talking about public health impacts. But there seemed to be something a little bit more in this debate. And um, I figured out that something had to do about the locale of the proposed fracking, and that being the Karua. And um, so, for instance, somebody during one of the public consultations that Shaw had, um, one of the participants stated, um, it's like you coming and drilling holes in our mother and le then leaving us to look after her and take her to hospital. So there is a profound sort of investment here in that, in that area that goes beyond, you know, you are going to contaminate our water. And so, so that made me curious. And then, of course, you know, um, I became curious about, well, you know, what, what do we do with this thing uh, once I've started figuring it out? When, when it comes to the law. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the message has been a recurring one, and that is that, that hydraulic, fra hydraulic fracturing, fracking, would lead to, to fracturing not just of a landscape, but also of, of community, of identity. Um, and then so finally, I, I then started to think about, well, it has got to do with this, with this sort of esoteric thing. Um, that is called sense of place. And I wanted to know more about it, and so I started to, um, to read a little bit more about it. Um, and so the question that, that I pose is, well, what is this thing called sense of place? Well, those of the, in the know, the anthropologists, the psychologists, they all speak about this. Um, the planners all speak about this. And they talk about it in the sense of, it's a relationship that we have with the biophysical space, um, that says something about our identity. So it's the identity of the place and then the relationship that people with, have with it. It's a concept that have, have, have a few more con, um, facets though. So, over, so what's situated within this relationship in the, by the biophysical environment, um, it is about identity, but it's also a way um, in the way that people attach themselves to one place. So it's been described as the symbolic relationship formed by people giving culturally shared emotional or effective meanings to a particular space or piece of land that provides the basis for an individual and a group's understanding of and a relationship to the environment. So it is more than an emotional and cognitive experience. It includes their cultural beliefs and shared practices. So. When I look at this picture, for example, I feel a, a strong sense of connection. This is not the Karua, this is the Northern Cape where I grew up. Um, and so for me, it, it speaks to my identity. It speaks to the fact that, you know, I, this is where I'm from. Um, I am physically connected to it and attached to it, even though I haven't lived there probably for the last 25 years. And it says a lot about me from, you know, for example, it probably explains why I've never really learned to swim properly. <laughs> a third facet, um, which is one that came out very strongly in this debate, which, which goes beyond the, the, the physical space, is that of what do people get out of the Karua, right? So there is... And when you talk about sense of place, there's also this notion of place dependence. So this speaks to, to social and economic needs. So hence the fact that farmers are up in arms about the fact that um, fracking may in fact attack, affect their livelihoods. Um, and then a little bit later, I'll speak to the fact that, that there's a whole other community that, that also relies on the Karua and, and whose voices are not really heard. 
So um, with respect to these three elements then, various studies have shown that place and inhabitants are intertwined and that the biophysical environment partially supports emotional security and psychological wellness of inhabitants. And so um, if we then look at the Karua specifically, we need to ask, well, what is it about the Karua that brings about this sense of place? Now, interestingly enough, um, it is in fact this particular landscape um, and the age of the landscape that has produced the gas that um, is now at the heart of the current debate around fracking. Because the gas is a remnant from about 275 million years ago when the Karua was a vast anoxic lake under which organic muds accumulated um, and then were buried up and cooked up as um, to a form of, of oil and gas. And so, in a way, this landscape that is um, such an ancient land landscape and treasured for its age is also producing that which um, is leading to, to the fracturing. It's home to dinosaur fossils that speaks to the ancient character of this area. And it's been touted as the only place in the world with such a time extensive fossil record of the early diversification of reptiles is preserved in a single basin. It's also a biodiversity hotspot. And the Karua is notable, of course, for its high biodiversity, but as you can see, very unique biodiversity. And then it's a region that is rich in culture and tradition. It's been inhabited by the Khoisan people for over 500,000 years. It has unique architecture, peach floors, sash windows, any one of you that has traveled through it will we'll notice that it is, in terms of its, of its um, older architecture, it has been adapted to, to, to deal with issues such as the very particular climate that, that it has. It also has some wonderful myths um, in the area. The, for those of you who remember, the Uniondale ghost is probably one of the oldest um, ghost stories that we have. Right, so let's just now look briefly at, at, at what is at issue here. And so here is, is a slide of gives you an indication of of the area that is potentially under exploration. Now, fracking, you probably know this, but um, it requires a company to first drill vertically um, and then go horizontally for um, possibly over a kilometer. They then inject sand, uh, water, and all kinds of contaminants, um, or they call it, we call it contaminants, they call it chem chemicals. Um, under extremely high pressure to actually fracture the shale and draw gas from this, from this process. Wells, of course, can be fractured numerous times. And so potential impact of this particular technology includes contamination of groundwater, um, it increased water use, of course. We don't know exactly uh, where this water will come from. The proponents of, of um, fracking have not really been able to to address us um, on this issue. Um, and then there's air pollution from methane emissions. There's dust impacts from increased transport. There's the possibility of seismic activity, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of uncertainty in this area because, of course, we don't know. We've never really done it in the Karua, and so we, we don't know the extent of the, of the impact. But as you can see, the size of the exploration areas is, is quite substantial. And so at this point, we're sitting with exploration rights for quite a few companies over and above Shell. There's a Shell, so Shell itself has about 90,000 square kilometers. Falcon um, has 30,000 square kilometers. Um, then the other big one is Sussel Stattel Chesapeake, which has uh, prospect rights for over 105,000 square kilometers. Whether they will take up these rights, you know, that's, that's not quite clear. We had an interesting discussion about two weeks ago of what it's going to cost from um, a financial point of view to actually extract shale gas. It is really capital intensive, um, and it's not clear that all of these companies that have rights allocated to them actually have the, 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 the finances to actually support um, this kind of high-risk um, prospecting whereas Shell financially is, is in a position to do so. 
Right, so just bringing this back to, to, the, to the space that we're talking about, and, and I'm a bit mischievous here because what I'm showing you is a picture of not um, shale gas or fracked um, gas, but it is so, um, normal gas exploration in the US. And so what we would have here in, in the Karua is not necessarily this kind of extent because of the fact that um, the technology that's going to be employed here uh, won't have this kind of proliferation of, of well pads. So they will be further apart. Um, but it gives you an idea of, of what to expect. And so um, I think from, from the Karua perspectives, we, we, or, or the perspective of the Karua, we need to think about what is it and what will it um, do to this, to this landscape. Um, and of course, when we think about this kind of scenario, um, the impact will of course not be felt on one particular pad, but it is about the cumulative impact of all of these um, pads together and the implications that this will have for, for aesthetics, for the visual landscape and for, for, the, for the more esoteric stuff, for the sense of place that people get from this. Um, right, so what are the concerns specifically for the Karua? Um, as I said, it's about the cumulative impact, it's about impacts on biodiversity, it's about impacts on its cultural heritage, its water resources, and it's also about impacts on livelihoods, those that make a living from a scarce water resource. So, um, what do we do with this? It's all nice and, and fuzzy and feel good and, you know, can it actually be used as a legal tool for those that are interested in stopping um, this technology from going ahead? It's been, this, this concept of sense, sense of place has been used um, very strongly as an advocacy tool. Um, you, some of you may be familiar around um, the proposed development around this space. It, it is a tiny little um, play area called Princess Play that's situated in the southern suburbs of Cape Town on the Cape Flats area. And a couple of years ago, um, there was a proposed mall development around this space. However, this is this is this area that has an interesting history. Um, so Francis Flay is situated in what is predominantly known as sort of a colored neighborhood. And during the apartheid era, even though it was really a prime site with its abundance of bird life and, and the scope that it provided for water sports, for example, it was now situated, um, according to the apartheid fathers, in this area that you really should not be accessed by um, white people. And so it was then set aside for recreational purposes for, for black communities in, in the Cape Flat areas. And so that is what it has become. Um, in fact, it's nicknamed Claremont Beach because it is... In, in essence, for a very long time, it was about the only recreational site um, for the community living in this area. Um, but it also became something a little bit more for the people living around it. And so typically on a Sunday morning, if you drive down to Princess Flay, you would see this kind of ritual being performed there. It's called the Groot Doop, the Great Baptism. So many, many communities use this site um, for baptism practices. Um, but it has an older and richer tradition and culture around this site. There are many myth, uh, myths around this area. There's, there's, there, they, it's called Princess Play because there once was a Cosa princess um, that apparently claimed this play. And so, and, and the Khoisan people have lots of traditions um, around and, and there are some, some communities that still um, um, gather at the FLAE for these purposes. And so what happened in this space is that those that were concerned about the conservation status of the FLAE um, came together with the church communities, came together with um, cultural leaders, with community leaders, and started a dialogue around what does the FLAE mean for us? 
And they really started the dialogue around sense of place. And so a lot of that um, involved storytelling, for example, about what, what this place means. And it really brought the community together around the space. And, and in fact, this area has become pretty dilapidated. Um, as a lot of, well, it's never really attracted a lot of, a lot of conservation money, and the city hasn't really paid that much attention to it. And, and so it sort of became, you know, apart from a Sunday, you know, it's an area where you typically find a lot of crime. But, but once you had this dynamic change around, around bringing back or, 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 you know, unearthing again the stories around community and, and what the place means for the community, the, the place has now changed as well. So now um, they have, for example, they, they call it dressing the princess is something that happens on a regular basis where the community comes and together with the conservation community talk about what kind of species should we bring, bring back and actively do it. Um, it's a site where school kids now come and, and, and look at conservation practices. They have a big festival every year around the space. So, and, and of course, the the, the um, plans to, to talk um, or to develop a wall has now, is now completely off the table. And that, that gives you a sense of, of what, what sense of place could mean from, from that kind of, of, of perspective. Right, so um, over and above that, the point for me is, well, you know, this is great. This is, this is advocacy, but as a lawyer, that's not quite enough for me. So I, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and see um, what else can we do? It can we use it as some kind of a legal tool? And then I came upon this case, um, which is a case that emanated from the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, um, and it's you know it's the typical kind of case that we also deal with, which is you know there's a mine that wants to you know apply for a right, or in this case it was a mine that wanted to expand its current um, mining area into a town of Bulga. Um, and so the Bulga Marbrudel Progress Association became very concerned about this planned expansion. As it was, there were a number of concerns that the community was already dealing with. And so in between, um, let's see, is this there? Yeah. So um, I see this is the problem. You know, when I have my glasses on, I can't see. Um, there. Have you found that after you turn 40, the, you know, the, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the quality of printing that really goes down <laughs> tremendously. Um, right, so, so here's, the, here's Balga, and behind it is the mine, and in between lies sort of a, a ridge. And so the mine was planning on expanding and basically cutting through this ridge. In the process, um, so this is the, the expansion area. Um, sorry, this, this red line is the expan expansion area. But in this process, um, they were going to either clear some protected woodlands area or in some respect come very close to those to those woodlands areas. So there were some clear um, conservation concerns from the from the Bulga community. As it was at the time that the mine was um, trying to, to apply for expansion, the community was already concerned about the levels of noise um, and the levels of dust that they were experiencing with, um, with the coal mine, with this coal mine. Um, they were also concerned about what's going to happen from a social perspective once this mine expands and bring in new workers. They're now much closer to the town and, and you know, the changing the, the social dynamics. And um, in particular, the, the community started talking about the fact that already with a, with a current um, the, or the current operations of the mine, there seem to be levels of distress within the community. And, and they wanted to know, well, what is, what is going to happen when, when our environment changes? Because right now there's, there's kind of a reach in between us and we're not directly faced with this incursion. 
once the mind comes through, it, it's going to be literally in our space. So the space that we live in is going to change profoundly. So they brought in this guy called Albrecht that um, has working has been working on a concept that he calls solastalgia. And so he talks about this as, um, let me just see if I have it here, yeah. He says, he talks about solastalgia as the pain or sickness that's caused by the ongoing loss of solace and the sense of desolation that's connected to the present state of one's home and territory. It's the lived experience of negative environmental change, right? So it is, you know, you're still around, but the environment changes around you. And he sees that as it's an, an attack on one's sense of place. But what happens to people? What, what happens to them psychologically? Because Albrecht is a, is a psychologist. He says it's a chronic condition that's tied to the gradual erosion of the sense of belonging, right? The stuff that I had on right in the beginning, the identity stuff, to a particular place and a feeling of distress. So psychological desolation about the transformation, the loss of well-being. He says this is in direct contrast to the dislocated spatial and temporal dimensions of just plain old nostalgia, um, which you can feel when, you know, if you've left your space. It's, it's the kind of stuff that I feel when I look at that picture of the Northern Cape. So, right, that's, that's just good old nostalgia. But his, he talks about solastalgia is the homesickness that you have when you are still located within your home environment. So, right, so this is kind of a weird thing for the law, right? This, this kind of fuzzy um, concept that, you know, what do you do with it? Um, but the court actually did something with it. You know, and that for us, for us here in South Africa, well, for me, you know, listening to this, I was, I was at a conference in Australia when um, one of the judges that actually sat on the court talked about this case. Um, and I immediately wanted to know, you know, why did you even consider it? Because um, Andy and some of the other lawyers here in the room will agree with me that our judges don't want to go in that space. You know, they don't want to go in the space of, of something that is not clear and measurable and can be objectively determined because that's what the law is all about um and the judge said to me you know what we sometimes need to have our boundaries challenged and this case profoundly challenged my own boundaries and so um, he talked about the fact that it was difficult for him to deal with this and so so the evidence that was presented was basically empirically based evidence that that um, Albrecht collected within the community and then presented to the court. Um, and it was, you know, Judge Preston um, talked about the fact that it was it was a strange phenomenon to him, but but he valued that experience of having to deal with something outside of his comfort zone. Um, and so for a number of reasons, but including this notion of, you know, removing people emotionally from, you know, their home area is something that the court took into account. So the court actually took this notion of, of solastalgia into account. Um, right, so the question then for me is, well, what do we do with it in, in the South African context? And sorry, I just need to, I, I promised the organizers that I'll try and make up some of the time. So. Um, so, right, so what do we do with this? And, and we have it already in a couple of places. So if we look at our Protected Areas Act, um, together with the regulations, you'll see, for example, that um, when, when you draft a management plan for a protected area, one of the things that you need to consider or that you must have due regard to is the area's sense of place. Um, and then the other um, um, part of the protected areas that speaks to sense of place is the fact that um, it's an offense, so it prohibits any significant alteration or change to the sense of place of a protected area. Now, there's no clear, unfortunately, indication of what sense of place actually means in the context of a protected area. So there's no way, so it talks about it in these two spaces. So you need to, to give due regard to it. Um, and, and I think even more importantly, it's an offense, but we have no idea what actually makes up 
sense of place. And so I don't think it's ever really been used in, in this context. Um, and so that, you know, but, but it was interesting for me once I started, you know, sort of seeing what, what is there to find that we do actually have, uh, have it in our protected areas. Um, and then the second um, area in our law where we have it is in the context of environmental impact assessment. And so, um, interestingly enough, um, what more than 20 years ago, you will recall this here, um, this, those of you that's from KZN, there was an application for mining rights for titanium inside the Greater St. Lucia Wetland Park, right? And so that created um, a battleground between the, the mining company, Richards Bay Minerals, and um, conservationists who wanted to protect the area. And so, in the end, the government commissioned an environmental impact assessment. Of course, at the time, we didn't have a regulatory framework for environmental impact assessment. Um, and it was actually one of the most extensive um, EIAs that, that was ever done. It, it lasted for about four years. And the outcome of, of it, um, as you know, it was a finding that mining would cause unacceptable damage to the Greater St. Lucia area. Um, but in particular, there were, there were three issues that were assessed as part of the EIA. So um, the environmental impacts were assessed, the economic impacts, and then finally, specifically, and that was the mandate of this commission, is to look at impact of, on issues of indirect or intrinsic concern um, and the principal concern of which was sense of place. And so um, a specialist report on sense of place was commissioned during this process. And that was instrumental in this finding that, that mining could not go ahead in this, in this area and the eventual establishment of the Ishimangalisho uh, Wetland Park. Now, currently, of course, the, the EIA process is, is regulated um, by way of NEMA. And um, in, in, in terms of, of it being a planning tool, Section 23.2b reminds us that the general objective of the EIA process is to identify, predict, and evaluate the actual and potential impact of the environment, of socioeconomic conditions, of cultural heritage, and to also evaluate the risks and the consequences and, and to look at alternatives and options for, for mitigation of activities. Um, and on the implementation side, the EIA regs talks about the fact that when an EIA, um, EAP, an environmental assessment practitioner, manages this EIA, EIA process, he or she must, report, must prepare a report that must contain a lot of information and that goes to the, the geographical, the physical, the biological, the social, the economic, and the cultural aspects of the environment. So what you can hear, of course, here is that none of it speaks very particularly um, to, to EIA. So the environmental assessment practitioner would compile reports on all of these various aspects um, and then can really decide whether they want to include um, something a little bit more, and that something a little bit more is very narrowly defined as visual and aesthetic impacts. And so some provinces, for example, in the Western Cape, um, have some guidelines on, on how to deal with, with, um, with visual and aesthetic impacts. But if you go back and if you cast your mind back to, to you know, how I explain sense of place, I'm not sure that you know, looking at visual and aesthetic impacts really captures in a very profound way the kind of stuff that that sense of place is made up. Because because those are, and I mean, I keep calling it the fuzzy stuff, but you know, it's it's just, it, it's our appreciation of color, of texture, of you know, the the feel of the wind as you sit on a on a mountain slope and it and it um, goes through your hair. You know, it's it's. It's understandably, understandably something that is much more challenging um, to kind of measure. And so, so within the scope of this, the EIA process, I'm not convinced that you can really effectively capture what the Karua really means for the people, um, especially if, you know, a lot of people that are not from that area uh, will, you know, will look at the Karua and say, well, you know, it's really made up of nothing. 
but but that's is essentially what people value in the Karua is the fact that it's made up of nothing. Um, and so and so, how do you capture that sense of connectedness, that sense of of, of attachment? Um, the, the other concern that I have about the EIA process is, of course, that it's very much specific uh, site um, oriented, right? So, um, you know, you, you can do an, an EIA around a, a, a specific uh, proposed site. But, of course, when we talk about the kind of map that I had on earlier, we, we're talking about a large area. So we need to look at sort of it, it beyond the specific site and, and what it will what effect it will have on the region. And so what, what this kind of thing, you know, to really make sense of place part of the law, I think, is, is probably to bring it closer to the planning side of things. And so, you know, you need to be sort of more forward looking. And of course, this once again doesn't really help us in, in the context of, of the Karua. But I think just in terms of going forward, where we have these kinds of places that have deeper meaning, is to look at how to strategically integrate it into um, our other tools, such as strategic environmental assessment, so that it becomes part of, of your bigger planning instruments, your provincial spatial development plans, your integrated development plans, and, and finally, um, um, in a more lawfully meaningful way in, in zoning laws. But yeah, at present, I don't see a great engagement with this concept at the planning level. Um, when you look at SPLUMA, for example, it contains a number of principles that, that should apply to spatial planning and land development and land use management. But none of these, they, um, it's, it's principles such as spatial justice, spatial sustainability, efficiency, spatial resilience. None of them really neatly captures the need to, to consider um, a sense of place. So, so yeah, and it's you know it's if you move into into the area of biodiversity planning, I think one one comes away similarly dis dissatisfied. So what are we left with? Um, I think well, first of all, one one shouldn't forget the, the the advocacy value of of sense of place because this is what what led to the to the victory for those who opposed development at uh, Princess Play, and of course also um, in in the Saint Lucia situation. And then the Bulgar case, I think, illustrates the fact that that sometimes, you know, you can actually persuade a judge to um, to push the boundaries of the law and and to um, introduce concepts such as the, the fuzzy solastalgia in into the fray. Um, and, and perhaps it can be a little bit more. Um, I don't want to go into this in in too much depth, but we we do have um, section 24 that speaks to the fact that we have um, a guarantee to environmental health and well-being. Um, and when we talk about how well-being, well-being, that's actually the element that speaks to the stuff that I just mentioned. It talked to, to the, to the um, psychological well-being, um, the, the fact that we should feel comfortable in, an, in our sense, sense of place. So for me, um, I think threats to well-being can probably be expanded to encapsulate you know, some of the biophysical um, concerns that, that people may have when it comes to, to fracking in the Karua. But, but when it comes to litigation, you know, look, Section 24 has always been sort of, you know, the proverbial bridesmaid and never the bride. So, so it's never been litigated in a South African court, but our courts have, have in, a, in a couple of cases, have um, interpreted law against the backdrop of, of Section 24. So, so I think we shouldn't, you know, we should keep that in mind when, when we think about um, sense of place. And then maybe a final thought with regard to, to this concept of sense of place. And that is something that I think um, we, we tend to forget when we, when we enter into these big debates around the need for conservation versus economic development. And that is um, the, the community that, that lives in this, that live in this area. Now, um, when we talk about the Karua, we need to keep in mind that this is an area that represents poverty for the landless black communities that, that live in the Karua. Um, it provides very little with respect to job opportunities. The, the wage um, income is, is almost negligible. 
So, so when you start talking to this community about an injection into the economy, and if you start spinning stories about we're going to offer you jobs, it's the kind of talk that's going to make this community sit up. And if you do even more, if you as the anti-fracking lobby ignore this community in all of your talks, um, you know, if you talk about, you know, the Karua as your mother and you don't ask your landless black neighbor, so how do you feel about the Rua, Karua? I think you're walking in a very dangerous terrain. And, and I think we've seen this, this playing out in, in this area. Because I wonder what, what um, sense of place um, the Karua holds for the rural poor and, and for the descendants of, of the Khoisan hunter-gatherers that are now limited to the, to the margins of society as it is. And so, um, you know, for me, it's, it's the kind of stuff that, that Sam raised this morning as well. So when um, the proponents of, of fracking talks about this huge economic injection into the region, I don't hear them talking about how they're going to provide energy you know, to people that do not have any access to energy? How are they going to provide water? How are they going to provide these kinds of basic services, education that, that, that people do not have? How are they going to facilitate it? So, so that, you know, that I don't hear. And on the other end, you know, like I said, I also don't see an engagement with, um, from the, from the um, anti-fracking side with this community to sort of see, well, what, what is it that you want out of this? How do you feel about the Karua as it is. And I'm sure once you start talking to these communities, you will see um, that you get a, perhaps not the same spin, but, but definitely kind of a, a similar message coming from them. So I was just saying just to, um, to somebody during the, the tea break that we haven't done enough sort of empirical studies into this, into the perceptions of, of the community around the whole fracking debate. You know, how do they really feel about you know, fracking? How do they feel about the invasion of, of space? What is it that they will get out of it? What is it that they will lose? Um, and so, you know, in that sense, I think it's very important that, that we connect with, with everybody in the Karua to, to get that message out of it. Because it's only once we actually have, and that's what the court did in the Balga case, it, it had the data to work with to actually then challenge um, the mining company in terms of, of what it proposed and put on the table. So um, with that, thank you very much. I hope I was able I was able to get you right back on time almost.